Coming up on this Tuesday edition of Newsline at noon, the government begins drawing up measures to improve safety in the nation following President Park Geun-hye's apology for last month's ferry disaster. Thailand's military declares martial law amid a months-long political crisis. The military, however, says it's not staging a coup and assures the public that there's no need to panic. Plus, underlining Korea's commitment to nuclear energy, President Park attends an installation ceremony of the first Korean-made nuclear reactor in the United Arab Emirates. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's noon Tuesday, May 20th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in live from Seoul. I'm Ajin Ju. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. The Seoul Ho ferry disaster has rocked public confidence in the Korean government and raised some very critical questions about just how safe we are as we go about our daily lives. President Bekunet pledged wide-ranging reforms in a televised address on Monday to ensure a similar tragedy never happens again. The government has already begun the process of making sure the president's words become reality. Adang News' Kim ji reports. The government wasted no time initiating follow-up measures to President Bakunay's package of remedies to ensure another disaster like the Seoho ferry accident does not happen in the future. As her address wrapped Monday, officials led by Presidential Chief of Staff Kim Gi chun broke President Park's remedies into five main sectors and 27 measures in total. The main sectors are the restructuring of government, reforming how government officials are appointed, proposing a special law to the National Assembly authorizing the establishment of a fact-finding committee into the ferry disaster, the establishment of a national safety ministry, and the establishment of a monument and a People's Safety Day on April 16th, the day of the ferry disaster. President Abak singled out corruption as the main factor undermining the country's safety standards, saying it created an atmosphere where the ferry could sink and take so many lives with it. Prime Minister Chung Ong Wan called for all out efforts Tuesday to revamp the country's safety management system and root out corruption among public officials. A large number of state run organizations are headed by retired public employees that have worked in firms and organizations related to their former responsibilities. These officials have been described as part of a bureaucratic mafia because of their tendency to have collusive ties with those they were supposed to supervise provide or regulate. According to the state-run provider of public information, Alio, 51 out of 153 heads of public organizations, or roughly one-third, could be categorized as bureaucratic mafia. President Park is expected to carry out a government reshuffle, including hiring a new prime minister, after she returns from a three-day trip from the UAE later this week. Kim ji Arirang News. And at the National Assembly, lawmakers have opened a plenary session that will attempt to find out just what went wrong in the Seoul Ferry disaster. Lawmakers from both ruling Senate Party and the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy put Prime Minister Chung Won Won in the hot seat this Tuesday morning, asking him whether the Coast Guard had taken appropriate measures at the time of the accident. The Prime Minister acknowledged that the Coast Guard had not carried out its full duties and said that further investigations to determine why were underway. Chung also said a safety control tower will be set up under the prime minister's office to overhaul the nation's safety management system. The Oceans Minister and the Coast Guard Chief are not expected to appear at the plenary session as the government says they are needed at the site of the ferry accident where search efforts continue for 17 victims still unaccounted for. And moving on, senior diplomats from North Korea and Japan will meet in Sweden next week as Tokyo seeks to accelerate discussions on the whereabouts of Japanese nationals 
kidnapped by the North decades ago. Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida said Monday that the three day government level talks will be held from next Monday in Stockholm. It will follow up on the two countries' first talks in more than a year in March. While the North's nuclear weapons program will be discussed, the Japanese abductee issue will top the agenda. North Korea admitted more than a decade ago that it had kidnapped 13 Japanese citizens in the 1970s and 80s. Only five abductees were returned, and the North claims the others have since passed away. Japan believes the number of people abducted was much higher. The North Korean nuclear issue and an upcoming trip by Chinese President Xi Jinping to Seoul is expected to top the agenda when China's Foreign Minister touches down in the South Korean capital next week for talks. Our Huang Sang-yi reports. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi will visit Seoul next Monday for talks with his South Korean counterpart Yun Byung-se as the two countries seek to put a stop to North Korea's nuclear ambitions. On top of the agenda, we'll be fine-tuning the details of Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Seoul. Xi is expected to make his first trip to South Korea since becoming president in the coming months. Although a specific date has not been set, South Korean government officials say the summit may take place in the first half of this year. Another pending issue on the table will be the possibility of a fourth nuclear test by North Korea. While North Korea appears ready to conduct a test at any time, Beijing may use Wang's visit to send a clear message to Pyongyang that its nuclear ambitions will not be tolerated and could result in stronger sanctions. At the same time, it could reiterate the need for dialogue to settle tensions on the Korean peninsula. Beijing and Seoul during Wang's visit may also exchange opinions about Japan's denial of history and its push for collective self-defense. Both nations, major victims of Tokyo's past militarism, have voiced concerns over the Abe administration's pursuit to revise its pacifist constitution without fully recognizing the country's wartime atrocities. The revision would allow Japan to come to the defense of an ally under attack, a revival of bitter World War II memories for the two nations. During his two-day stay, the Chinese diplomat is also scheduled to visit with President Park Geun-hye and Presidential Security Advisor Kim Jang-soo. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah Jin Ju. Even when I'm Ah Jin Ju, which is pro. strategy analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics. Martial law has been declared by the army in Thailand. Pro and anti-government protesters have been warned in no uncertain terms not to move around Bangkok. The declaration comes after months of unrest and the deepening political crisis in the country. Our Kwon Soa has this report. Thailand is under temporary military rule as the army in the early hours of Tuesday morning local time declared nationwide martial law to restore order in the crisis-hit country. To maintain peace and order and bring back peace into all groups and all sides as soon as possible, I used Law Section 2 and 4 and Martial Law 2457 to announce martial law all over Thailand. He denied a military coup was underway, only saying the army needs to take charge of public security. General Prayut also urged people to carry on with their business as usual. Thai public television showed images of soldiers outside broadcast stations in Bangkok Tuesday, announcing that all TV stations were being secured by the military. An aide to the interim prime minister was quoted as saying the move had not been relayed to the government beforehand and that it remains to be seen whether the army chief will agree to stay impartial. The aide added this declaration of martial law was half a coup. Thailand's army has staged 11 coups since the end of absolute monarchy in 1932. The last one occurred in 2006. 
The declaration of martial law comes two weeks after Prime Minister Ying Nak Shinawat was ousted from office, along with nine cabinet ministers, for allegedly abusing their power. Anti-government protesters had wanted Ying Nak out for months. The government had scheduled elections for July 20th after earlier polls were canceled due to mass protests. The next elections are also likely to be boycotted by anti-government protesters who want the remnants of Ingnuk's government out and a neutral leader installed. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye is currently in the United Arab Emirates to attend a ceremony celebrating the installation of the first Korean-made nuclear reactor there. Her visit to the Gulf at such a sensitive time shows how important these nuclear reactor deals are to the country. Seoul hopes to secure more highly lucrative deals across the region in the coming years. Na Hyun-gang reports. Despite criticism about the timing of the trip, President Park is squeezing in a short two-day visit to the United Arab Emirates starting Monday. It goes to show just how important she and the government regard the joint project in the Arab country. A 1,400-megawatt light water reactor built with Korean technology will be installed in Baraka, west of Abu Dhabi, and President Park will attend a ceremony celebrating the installation of the reactor, which is part of an estimated $40 billion bid Korea won in 2009. The deal includes the construction of four nuclear units in the region by the year 2020. Approximately 1,600 Korean workers are currently at the construction site in Baraka, and depending on the progress, Korea is said to be receiving up to nearly $300 million per month from the UAE. The first nuclear unit is not expected to be completed until 2017, but Korean government officials are hoping President Park's visit this week will demonstrate the nation's strong commitment to the project and send a message to other countries that may be considering similar deals with Korea. Saudi Arabia, for example, is looking to generate up to 20 percent of its electricity needs through nuclear energy by 2030. It plans to do so by building a total of 16 nuclear units by the year 2032, with the goal of having the first reactor online in seven years' time. Vietnam is also looking for a contractor for building nuclear power plants, and with winners of both bids expected to be decided by the end of this year, the state-run Korea Electric Power Corporation is pulling out all the stops to make sure the deals are brought to Seoul. Na hyun Arirang News. And despite signs of a recovery, Korea's share in global trade inched down last year for the first time since 1998. Figures released by the Bank of Korea and the Korea International Trade Association show Korea was ninth in combined imports and exports last year among members of the World Trade Organization. China topped the list, followed by the U.S., Germany and France. Korea ranked 12th in 1997, fell two notches the following year after a foreign exchange crisis, but have been steadily climbing up the ladder since. Experts attribute the fall to a slump in imports last year, which dipped 0.7 percent from a year earlier. Exports aren't faring so well either in terms of the global share. Korea's share of exports in the global market came in under the 3 percent range for the second straight year in 2013. Korean companies operating in India are looking at the recent victory of the BJP and its leader Narendra Modi as an opportunity to expand business ties in the nation of 1.2 billion people. Modi, who is perceived as being rather market friendly, has pledged to cut the nation's unemployment rate and Korean firms will be making their case that they can create new jobs. POSCO is set to return to talks regarding the construction of a steel mill which has been on hold for almost a decade due to land acquisition issues and environmental concerns. Samsung Electronics and LG plan to release a range of low-priced smartphones to meet growing demand in India. In a recent survey conducted on 200 Korean companies in India, 63% said they believe that business conditions would improve under the new government. Now, Korea's producer prices dropped for the 19th straight month in April on a strong local currency, which pulled down raw material prices. The Bank of Korea said Tuesday that producer prices fell 0.3% last month from a year earlier. The drop was mostly led by prices of industrial 
goods that were influenced most by the lower raw material prices. However, the prices for service and agricultural products, both of which are closely related to people's livelihoods, all rose from the previous year. Now, the tragic sinking of the Sewell Hove ferry last month has affected the country in numerous ways. In a purely economic sense, though, the, dis the disaster rather caused consumer spending to plunge. The Korea Credit Finance Association said Tuesday that after analysing car transaction records, spending on clothing, leisure and beauty products in April tumbled compared to the same month last year. The amount spent on leisure activities was actually up 27% during the first half of April, but tumbled by 31% in the latter half of the month. And the uh, Sewolho ferry sank on April 16th, right in the middle of the month. Data also shows more Koreans took out insurance policies following the disaster amid growing concerns about safety. Now, if you live overseas or are a foreigner living here in Korea and have tried to purchase goods off Korean websites in the past, you'll be absolutely over the moon by this news because from the, today, this Thursday, uh, this Tuesday rather, authentication certificates will no longer be required for online purchases made from abroad. The Financial Services Commission and the Financial Supervisory Service says shoppers will no longer have to go through the arduous process of submitting authentication authentication uh, of one's identity when buying goods in excess of roughly 300 US dollars. Up until now, internet shoppers had to install ActiveX software on their computer and download a program provided by local financial institutions. The software was a major headache as it did not work on all web browsers and limited access to online shopping. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following at this hour. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim at the News Center. Eunice, uh, China has denounced and denied U.S. charges that five of its army officers hacked into the computers of American companies. Right. It's another thorn in the already thorny Sino-U.S. relations, and it represents a shift in the way the United States goes after hackers. Here's Yurian with the story. China says charges that five of its military officers have been engaging in cyber espionage are completely made up. China's foreign ministry on Monday called on the U.S. to immediately withdraw its charges, saying they will only stand to damage U.S.-China relations. In the most immediate sign that they will, Beijing has already said they are suspending the activities of the China-U.S. Cyber Working Group, an initiative agreed on by both countries just one month ago. Earlier on Monday, U.S. prosecutors charged five Chinese military officers of stealing trade secrets from five companies. It's the first time the U.S. has filed such criminal charges against a foreign state. Uh, what I think distinguishes this case is that we have um, a state-sponsored entity, state-sponsored individuals using intelligence tools to uh, gain commercial advantage. And that is what makes this case um, different. The accused officers belong to Unit 61398 of the People's Liberation Army, a unit long believed to be staffed by thousands of Chinese cyber troops. China denies any involvement, which doesn't come as a surprise to experts. Uh, the Chinese have basically two responses. One is, we're not spying on you, we don't hack you. Uh, and the second one is, uh, in fact, you guys are the biggest hacking empire in the world. Uh, we've seen through the Snowden revelations that you are constantly hacking into other countries' networks. Uh, you are the big hypocrites, um, and we are the biggest victims. The landmark case is expected to pave the way for more indictments down the road, and it shows that the U.S. is serious about holding foreign governments accountable for cyber attacks. Washington estimates cyber espionage costs the U.S. economy as much as 100 billion U.S. dollars a year. Yudian, Arirang News. 
And staying with China, the first group of Chinese workers that boarded one of four ships sent by Beijing on Monday are reported to have arrived in a port in Hainan province. Xinhua News Agency had reported earlier that an additional 4,000 Chinese citizens had boarded the ships on Monday to flee Vietnam and its recent spate of anti-Chinese violence. Among the evacuees were contract workers from the steel plant in central Vietnam, owned by Taiwan-based Formosa Plastics Group one of the worst hit sites of last week's violent riots that left at least two Chinese workers dead and more than 100 others injured. Last month's parliamentary elections in Iraq has handed a partial victory for Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki. Baghdad's election commission said Monday Maliki's State of the Law Alliance took the most number of seats in the Council of Representatives with 92 of the 328, but it still fell short of a majority, requiring Maliki to win the support of rivals in parliamentary affairs, some of whom oppose a third term for the Iraqi leader. And relatedly, the Independent High Electoral Commission said 62 percent of the 22 million eligible voters did cast their ballots in Iraq's first election since U.S. troop withdrawals in 2011. And Ukraine will hold its presidential elections this coming Sunday, and ahead of it, Russia announced its forces have begun to withdraw from the Ukrainian border. But the West says it has yet to see any indication of troop movement. White House spokesman Jay Carney said such an unkept promise was nothing new, while NATO Secretary General Anders Fulk Rasmussen said he would welcome a troop pullout or pullback as a first important contribution to de-escalating the crisis. Tensions continue to batter eastern Ukraine as dozens of Ukrainian servicemen have been killed in anti-terrorism operations in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Well, thank you very much, Eunice, for the international headlines there. And Korea is going to begin operating a magnetic levitation train out of the nation's gateway, Incheon International Airport. The hyperfuturistic mode of transportation, like its name suggests, levitates above the track with the help of incredibly powerful magnets. Kim Min Ji has more. Unlike conventional trains, this magnetic levitation train uses a powerful magnetic field to travel along the rails. It has no wheels and suspends itself about 8 millimeters above the tracks. Let's see how it works. The train encases the track in a C-shape and electromagnets are attached on both the top and bottom. When electric current passes through the electromagnets placed underneath the tracks, the train lifts slightly. Now, when current also flows into the electromagnets above the track, the opposite poles of the magnet move into formation and create a push-and-pull effect, making the train move forward. As it uses a magnetic field to move, the noise created is only about 80 percent that of subway trains, and it also causes minimal vibration. Even when the maglift train travels at its maximum speed of 110 kilometers per hour, vibrations can hardly be felt inside. It can also be operated without an engineer, which cuts down operation costs. There's no friction between the wheels and tracks, so maintenance costs are extremely low. The train was created using homegrown technology and is being made safer through two years of efficiency tests. The braking distance has also been reduced to 100 meters, and the electronic waves the train emits are lower than those of a television. It uses existing rail and road networks, and because it causes less noise and vibration, it is also eco-friendly. After commercialization in July, Korea will become the second country in the world after Japan to operate the maglev train. It will run on a six-kilometer rail line from Incheon International Airport and will be free of charge for the time being. Kim min -ji, Arirang News.
Good afternoon. Well, as we can see, rain clouds are dominating the southern parts of the peninsula. Well, it's been raining since this morning in Jeju and it's spreading to other southern regions. But all the precipitation should gradually go away late in the afternoon. So a much cooler day is in store for the southern parts of the country. But it's going to be another summer-like afternoon here in the capital. In fact, temperatures on Friday Friday will hike up to 29 degrees Celsius, so a hot day is definitely on the way. Now, over in Chindo at the Seolho Ferry Extant site, the winds and waves will strengthen today, but the currents in the water will remain weak. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The high in Seoul will rise to 27, while Taegu will peak at 24. Gwangju and Busan should climb to 22 and 21 respectively. Now for other regions, down on Jeju and Daejeon will reach 21 and 25, while Mount Kungang tops out at 16. Well, that's all for me today, but I'll be back with more updates tomorrow morning. Thank you very much, Gion, for the weather update there, and those are the stories we're following at this hour. Mark and I'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you for watching.